Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're chatting with a man who shares my pain of getting barbecue sauce dreadlocks in his beard. Hey family, hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. If you have been uh, joining us earlier today, today we're doing a marathon podcast session today and I'm going to explain why just shortly coming up. But I do have a little bit of a frog in my throat today. So it's it's not your headphones, it's me. Um, I'm hanging out pretty well so far. I do want to start off this episode with a shout out to Cam Duggan. He did try to jump on board with us um, earlier today and he just uh, he just missed us for the first episode. So mate, second episode for the day. Cheers to Cam Duggan, mate. There you are. Now, in today, in, in this episode today, we're talking to Todd Hill from Jackalope Trading Co. Um, they're from uh, Brisbane, so they're pretty local to me, and they make some of the nicest rubs. Um, a personal favorite of ours is their dark side rub uh, here at Smoking Your Confessions. But we're going to hear uh, a, a bit more from that a bit later on. First, I've got a, just a couple of announcements that I do need to run by you. The first is that I'd like to welcome our podcast partner for this episode, Jagged Woodfired. Based out of WA, it's a husband and wife team, Julianne and Glenn. They design and build their own smokers. They're an incredibly unique design and they're championship winning proven design. So they've performed so well that they managed to earn themselves an entry to the World's Barbecue Championships over in Houston. And also most recently, um, the Smoking Hot Jagged Edge, which is the name of their competition team. They have just uh, picked up the... Uh, KCBS International Brisket Team of the Year Award. So they are doing really well with that. And if you are in the market for a new smoker, do check them out because they've got great gear and they're great people and you're supporting Aussie Made. Next up, winter is coming. How's that for an original line? I bet you never heard that before. We've got uh, hoodies and beanies available for you to keep you warm during those cold hours when you're up tending the fires on your pits. So head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. Our award-winning Hail Mary design is on the back of that hoodie there. And we've got our beautiful uh, beanies with our 3D stitching there as well, all printed and stitched by local Gold Coast businesses. So you're supporting family-run businesses there again as well. Next up, do keep the weekend of June 26 and 27 free because we are putting on BarbieCon. Smoking Hot Confessions is going to bring you the world's first virtual barbecue conference. So what we're doing, we've set aside the weekend. Saturday is going to be all about cooking barbecue. And then Sunday is going to be all about the business of barbecue. So no matter where you're at in the industry, we're going to have you covered. And we're going to be using this technology that we use to do this live uh, live broadcast podcast. We're going to be jumping into the backyards of different pitmasters. We're going to be jumping into the workshops of different um, barbecue businesses. And we're going to be sharing that knowledge with you. So that's going to be super cool. So do hang out with us for that. Now, if you are just at the beginning of your barbecue journey, if you're watching this and you're like, man, I'm really into this low and slow, but I don't know where to start. We've got the perfect thing for you. It's the Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. It's a free ebook that we've made available for you over on the Smoking Hot Confessions website. It is smokinghotconfessions.com. It's going to pop up automatically. Just put your details in there and we'll shoot that straight out to your inbox for you. And now, if you are joining us live today for this recording with Todd, that means you're already in the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue community on Facebook. We're starting to get a few uh, comments coming through already. Some people are saying hi to Todd here. So we're going to pass those messages on in just a minute. If you would like to be a part of the live podcast recording experience, do come join us, Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue community on Facebook because that is where we do the live recordings, obviously, like we are right now. It's also the nicest little corner of the internet. We leave all the guff at the door, and we just hang out and talk about barbecue, and everybody's welcome. We're one of the most inclusive places you're ever going to find on the internet. So do come join us. It's all family-friendly stuff, and it's all barbecue-related, which sometimes is a nice change from, um, from a lot of the barbecue, or actually any groups, really, that we do get involved with. So YouTube, if you're watching this later on on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, a subscribe, and hit that little notification bell. If you're watching on Facebook, we want the thumbs up, the share, the comment, all that beautiful stuff. IGTV, we do have an IGTV channel. Give us a love heart and a follow over there. And if you are listening on a podcast app, give us a five-star rating and review, particularly if you're on Apple Podcasts. We've had a flurry of reviews come in lately, which has helped drive us to number six on the US, US Apple Podcast charts for food which is pretty incredible stuff. Now, back to Todd. So Todd is the founder of Jackalope Trading Co. It's a business, a business. Wow, I'm on fire today. It's a Brisbane-based 
rub manufacturer that boasts a lineup of rubs that are 100% spice. So no filler, no artificial flavors, no colors, and no anti-caking agents. So that's going to be a really interesting insight into that aspect of the barbecue industry. But I think that is just about all you need to hear from me. So let's bring Todd in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Good. Actually, it's afternoon now. Good afternoon, Todd. How are you, mate? Welcome to the confessional. Hello, mate. How are you? Thanks very much. I'm I'm good. I'm good. And it's great to to see you here. So first question, as always, what was the last thing that you barbecued, sir? Uh, I'm actually barbecuing right now. So I actually have a uh, a pastrami on uh, in the kettle. Ooh, so nice. I um yeah my um my partner who who we catch up every couple of weeks. We we don't live together, so she's been baking and uh and she's been baking these amazing bagels. So I challenged her to um bake some rye bagels. So I'm actually she's actually in front of me doing it right now. And um, so I thought, well, what better? So I grabbed, a, grabbed myself a nice Wagyu corn silver side from, uh, from young Billy, from me to Billy's, and uh, just got my pastrami rub on it, and she's in the kettle as we speak. So, and Billy does some great meats there, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. He's, he's been a part of my journey for, for many years. He was my meat supplier when I was catering. So, it's, um, yeah, it does amazing stuff. And the, and the corn silver side has just got this ridiculous uh, marbling through it. It makes it very easy. So, yeah. 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 So that's, so that's, just, that's just plodding along in the kettle. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Now, when it does come to pastrami, you uh, you don't obviously corn the meat yourself. You you buy it pre pre done. I've done both. I've done both, and and um, I think it's important, particularly when you know you're developing a product, that you have to really understand that not everyone's going to do it the same way that you do, uh, which is obviously go to get a wagyu corn silver side from Billy. So it's really about, um, you know, so I tried, you know, brining my own, I've done brisket, I've done silver side, I've done shorties. Shorties are amazing, by the way. Oh, yeah? Um, oh, yeah. Ridiculous. It's a beautiful, crusty bark. And yeah, so shorties just my favorite thing anyway. But um, it's, um, and then did it from obviously different ranges. So I literally just go buy a corned beef from Coles, um, you know, play around with that sort of stuff and, you know, major supermarket stuff, different, um, you know, di- different butchers and just to make sure it actually balances regardless of what anyone's doing because obviously, you know, when you're making it, it might work on on one product but but not another. So, hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So is that, um, is that Weber Kettle then? Is that your favourite barbecue? How many have you got and what's your go-to when you're cooking at home? I've got nothing but kettles. So I've got um, five kettles. Um, also got a little compact, got a GA. I've got a little, um, a little, uh, $85 spinner, um, that, <laughs> that I do rotisserie on as well. And, and I actually confess, I do have a gas barbecue, but I think, I think it actually has credibility because it's an original, um, first edition Weber, um, Genesis. So it's, uh, from about 85, wow. it's red. It's, it's not, you know, you see some of the pictures of the way people look after their barbecues. Um, I do not do that. Uh, they are, they are, def- they are definitely all cookers, but at the moment I'm, I'm using, um, a copper kettle from the States and you can't get that. Um, you can't get it here. Um, so I was, I was lucky enough to, um, pick up one of those and, and I just sort of looked at it for about two years and then I thought, well, hang on, this is not how I roll. So, um, it's actually the first Weber I've ever had that's got a temp gauge on it. So it's, uh, yeah, a whole new, whole new world of, uh, whole, whole new world of technology, a temp gauge on the lid. Who knew? Yeah, goodness gracious me, yeah. So yeah. how did you actually get that into Australia? Uh, I've actually got a good friend of mine that I'm involved with, um, uh, Taylor Middleton. I'll give him a little shout out because he was amazing for me. Um, he, uh, we're involved at the local AFL club where our, where our kids played footy. And, um, and I got him into barbecue and he started collecting Webers like everyone else does. And then um, his sister at the time was working in the States. And she came over for a visit and he managed to get a copper kettle um, brought over as luggage. So there was no shipping cost. Nice. And then um, about a year later, he hit me up and said, oh, my sister's coming back. Would you, would you like a kettle? So, you know, this lovely, I should, I should, give, I should give her a shout out, but her name escapes me. But uh, Taylor's sister, thank you, um, literally just brought it on the plane as luggage. And um, so it ended up only costing me, I think, in Australian dollars, 240 so it was um it was an absolute steal and it's uh it's beautiful i love it and uh all my others are just rabbles absolute rabble kettles so they've just been <laughs> hammered and i you know 
rarely clean them and, and yeah, they're for cooking, right? So that, that's my thought. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a, there's a ton of different things that, that you can cook on a, on a kettle, a whole bunch of different ways. What's your favorite thing to barbecue for yourself? Um, look, pastrami is still right up there. Um, it's still, you know, one of my, one of my favorite things to do because it's taking something and turning it into something else rather than just cooking it. So, um, but if we're talking low and slow, it's really, uh, shorties. So, you know, from, from back in my catering days, I did enough brisket and pull, you know, pulled pork to last me a lifetime. Um, and, uh, so these days if I'm cooking for myself and I want to treat, I'll just get some nice, uh, nice shorties, hopefully some MB4s rolling around somewhere and, um, yeah, give them a whirl. Um, beyond that, I've probably started to really lean towards, um, a bit more technique. So getting more into direct grilling or some, you know, reverse sear or, you know, really trying to play around with, um, South American stuff or Southern European stuff or North African and so on, just really try and, wow. you know, play around. Cause I'll, I'll really like, um, you know, focusing on what goes with meat, how to balance it. So, you know, you get your sides and obviously, you know, with chimichurri and, um, and, um, and pico and, and things like that. So, you know, and obviously just grilling appropriately. So, you know, a nice piece of butterfly lamb leg and just sort of reverse sear it and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, man. Tell me a bit more about the, the North African barbecue. I've never heard anyone sort of refer to that as a, oh, look, as a all, regional all we're style. talking about there is really, um, you know, playing around with different spices and then using it with, um, so it, it has its roots really around that sort of, you know, that Middle Eastern style, that Turkish, that Greek. So it's quite similar in that sense, but it's just using different spices. So you'd have, you know, like some sumac and, and that sort of stuff to be able to try and uh, set it off. And then, um, you know, lots of things using flatbreads and, and so on. So, yeah, so quite similar to that sort of, um, you know, Southern European into, into Turkey and so on. So. So is it more direct grilling then? Like, like oh, well, straight really, over yeah. the charcoal? Ab- yeah, yeah. Absolutely direct grilling. Yeah. And I like it because it's, it's theater. You have to be there. Um, you know, I, I can, I can assure you that, you know, low and slow has, um, you know, set and forget. I've got a, um, I've got a little kettle snake rolling around in there at the moment. So, um, yeah. And that just, you know, I can just come here and have a chat to you and know that it's just doing its thing. But I do like the idea of sort of cooking for friends and family direct and, and having a bit of theater behind that. So, mm. yeah, yeah. There's always those, uh, like if you, if you cook a T-bone, you stand it on its end and then the fat sort of drizzles down onto the charcoal and flames up and everyone goes, yeah, well, you wow. Yeah, you know, then the heat, the heat sort of rises up the bone and that's how you get that gets cooking out as well. So you don't get it uh, nice and raw, um, you know, you don't get too raw in the middle. So that's, that's my understanding of why we stand it on its end. So oh, okay. It actually, yeah, the heat actually, well, you know, I could be wrong, but that, that, that's what I was taught is that uh, the heat actually comes up through the bone and that way, you know, sometimes you might eat a T-bone and it just gets rarer and rarer the closer you get to the bone. Yeah, um, right. If you're at the pub. So, yeah, so that sort of avoids that. Oh, so, I, was just, yeah. I always just thought that that was theatrics. Oh, no, it definitely has a cooking <laughs> purpose. As far as I know, I'll, yeah. I'll just put a disclaimer. That every, everything I say today is really just... I'll just put an IMHO on that. So it's in my humble opinion, it may, it may or may not be true. Um, it's just, I'm sure everyone's got a different reason and different, um, you know, you know, you see enough stories about why people use kosher salt to realize that everyone's got a different opinion. So yeah. 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 Fair enough. I can hear that. Um, okay. So you're also from, from Southeast Queensland where I am as well. And one of the things mm. that I'm always about is discovering new local places to go and do things. So the, the, the first part of the question is um, where are some of your favorite places to go to either take a barbecue and cook for yourself? So it might be like a beach or a park or a, something like that. And then yeah. where do you like to go to eat at like a barbecue joint? So, um, well, it's twofold. Um, the one is that um, I guess in terms of um, supporting local guys, um, old school barbecue up in D Bay. Um, Chris up there is just amazing, just an amazing couple. Um, uh, Chris and Michi and, and I've had a, they're, they're, um, yeah, got my little, little sachets of rubs in there. They've been a really good supporter, but they just do amazing food as well. Um, and they're just in an old sort of strip mall in, in Deception Bay. And, uh, and it's funny, like the mall itself is kind of, um, you know, like a, like a suburban strip mall. So it's not that busy, but they absolutely pack the thing out every weekend and some of the best barbecue rolling around and he does it really old school so he's cooking fresh daily he's fighting right. for water um yeah so he does amazing stuff and he's um 
just got so many tattoos. He's a great guy. And and on on the weekend they get um you know like um uh, old cars and stuff like that roll in there. So there's a bit of oh, bit of theater cool. attached to that. You know, and then we get um obviously you know Jamie down at Bare Knuckles. You know, really good guy, and he's obviously grounded out for a long time doing pop ups and things. And now he's got his own place. Um, you know, and he's a really good guy. And then of course there's 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 me, I guess. Like we um I've just recently um uh partnered up with a with a friend of mine and we we actually do pop ups and I'm back uh back on the tools from time to time and um I'm actually doing one tomorrow. So that's um that should be wow. a lot of fun out of out of the Mount Crosby Bowls Club. And um so the last time we did it, I understand it was the busiest day that ever had. So it was um on a Sunday. So we're back doing that. That should be a lot of fun. And the best part about that is, is that um, my son that lives with me here, uh, he helped me. Um, but now that my other boy's up from Melbourne, we're actually going to, um, just for the week, we're, we're going to do it together. So it'll be the first time the three of us have done a food service together in five years. So I will probably just, you know, quite frankly, cry the whole time. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and we'll probably relax because my, my oldest son's working in a hatted restaurant now and some of the food he puts up, I imagine he'd be uh, be able to smash out a barbecue service pretty pretty easily. So I'll just relax like they used to when they were 15 or 16 and they did all the hard grunt. So, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. while, I'm paying him, while I'm paying him $4 an hour. So it was... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, and that's good. In terms of, in terms of myself, like I, I just like co- um, cooking with family and friends. So I just like going to, I, I probably don't do a lot of public barbecue, if that makes sense. So I, um, yeah, just really do it my own home or go to friends and, and we all jump in together and there's just something, you know, really cool about it. Um, probably one of my favorite things to do now is um, I, I bought a little hibachi and, um, and my friend, my friend Steve from, from Ironwood, he, he got one as well. And, and we'll sort of get those hibachis going on his back table and just have a whole heap of stuff laid out and dipping sauces and things. And it just adds a nice bit of theatre to the night. And, yeah, he's, he's got a lovely property out there and a bit of acreage so we can just be as loud as we like. So, yeah. Oh, mate, that sounds amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, lots of fun, lots of fun. Yeah, so is that, hmm. that, uh, that gig you got on tomorrow, is that trading as Jackalope? No, it's actually uh, my uh, well. It's obviously an old business of Steve, so um, it's yeah, probably getting a bit of a scoop here. Um, in that Steve and I have actually so Steve Spina from Ironwood Ironwood Smokers, um, we've actually invested in each other's business. So um, you know, both of us wanted to sort of grow and accelerate our own growth, and and Jackalope because I still I still have a day job, and I was reaching that tipping point where I really couldn't keep up with the growth myself. Um, and I wanted to, you know, really sort of rather than get employees or rather than get a, an investor, um, you know, we're sort of sitting back one night and having a few drinks and I'll, I'd actually sponsored his barbecue team for a little while and, um, the Basty boys, great name. And, um, and we're sort of sitting there and, and we sort of floated the idea of, you know, what if we actually invested in each other? And, um, so, you know, we sort of fleshed out what that might look like and, um, and we've now done it. So he, he's now, um, a partner in Jackalope. And, um, and I'm a partner, we've rebranded it as Ironwood Barbecue. And um, so he's obviously got an online business or we have an online business doing all things barbecue, wood, charcoal, rub sauces. Um, and uh, we also do obviously now catering and, and these pop-ups. So that's, that's where it's branded and that's, that's what we're up to. So it's, uh, How awesome. It, it is. And, and as I say, it's probably a little bit different um, to how people might normally grow. Um, but I loved, um, I love the concept of being able to share it with someone, you know, it's never really been about money for me. Um, you know, I do what I do because I'm passionate about the flavors and what I'm making and, uh, being able to share it with someone. Um, and he's just, just a really great guy. You know, we were obviously friends first. Um, so it'll either be amazing or it'd be the easiest way to end a friendship, but, um, we'll, um, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be fine. Like any, like any good relationship in any form. Um, communication and honesty is key and, um, yeah, we, we get along great. And obviously, you know, we're, we're seeing the benefits even just now with, with the growth in Jackalope, um, you know, just having him on board has been, been amazing. So I don't regret it at all. Yeah. Finding someone who's got complementary skills and then being able to share the workload yeah. according to, yeah, well, to, yeah your, we're probably, to your... probably a little bit, probably a little bit too alike then, but that's, that's all right. I think that's, oh. that's a good thing. So his, his faults, probably my faults, but, um, that's, uh, and then here's the truth of mine. But we, we actually bounce off each other really well. And he had some really good ideas. And, um, you know, that's, um, 
you know, we're in the middle of, um, we're developing a, a new flavor at the moment. So I'm sort of putting, throwing around ideas on what that might look like. And, um, you know, so it's, it's actually been really cool to sort of share that um you know concept with him and um you know being able to taste it and test it and see what works and and take on his ideas um it's been a new experience for me because i'm generally a control freak and um like things done my own way um but it's, it's a good lesson for me in terms of being able to you know step back and take on others advice and and quite frankly everything that he's come forward with so far has been a winner so it's been that's awesome, awesome. If you're looking for your next barbecue smoker or grill, Jagged Woodfired has got what you need. Owners Julianne and Glenn are multiple award-winning barbecue competitors who've even travelled to the US to compete at the World Barbecue Championships in Houston, Texas. Based out of Perth and shipping nationwide, Jagged is one of the largest pit builders in the country and has an ever-growing lineup of meat cooking machinery. Not only do they have their now famous smoker ovens, their incredibly efficient gravity-fed cabinets are proving extremely popular in commercial settings, and they also make some of the most stylish asado grills you're ever going to see. Jagged is also well known for amazingly detailed custom work ranging from backyard designs all the way to installations in commercial kitchens. Proudly Australian designed, owned and manufactured, you can find out more at jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D. Once again, head to jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D to learn more. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. So you, you're obviously like just highly motivated with, with barbecue. I mean, you've, you've just told us all these different ways that you're um, attacking this industry. So what, what is it about barbecue for you? Is it, is it just the food? Is it, is it purely a business? Is it, is it the connection to like old family memories? What, what keeps you motivated to get up and just keep doing this? Every um, day? It's probably everything but business in that, in that the idea that, you know, I was following the theory that, um, do what you're passionate about and, and, and the money will come. Um, you know, my background, I know we're chatting earlier is that, um, I ran, um, steel companies, steel distribution companies for around 20 years. And that took me from, um, from Perth to, um, I lived in, in New Zealand on the East coast and Tauranga. So if there's anyone in, in New Zealand listening or they're going to listen later. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I worked for, for a large steel company over there and then in Adelaide and, and then up to Brisbane and then, um, um, like yourself, um, post GFC, uh, I was, I was made redundant and that was an opportunity for me to sort of really reflect on what I wanted to do. And, um, I'd done almost 20 years in the industry. Um, my family, I'm third generation in the food industry. So most of my family have got a long background. Um, you know, my, my mother used to have a sort of a, I guess a food truck for want of a better word in a little, I grew up in a little mining town called Kembalda in WA. And wow. she used to, um, yeah, you've probably never heard of it. There's like 2000 yeah. people there, but, um, <laughs> it's about half an hour, it's about half an hour South of Kalgoorlie. So I was born in Kalgoorlie and I spent a lot of my, um, a lot of my early years there. And then, um, my mother had a business sort of running around doing lunches and things at, um, at mine sites. That's a nickel mining town. So the whole thing's driven around mining. Um, my grandmother had B and B's, my aunts and uncles had milk bars, restaurants, cafes, hotels. Um, my cousin had, um, a really iconic, um, food van called Beryl's Burgers down in Esperance. And, um, yeah, so it was a natural progression for me. I, I grew up around food and, um, I've, I've always grown up cooking, um, as you can see clearly eating as well. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and the flip side of that is my dad, good old Terry. Um, uh, he was, he, he and his father were really experienced Bushmen and everything that we used to do was over fire. So we, we didn't have a gas barbecue growing up. Um, everything was over a, a, a fire, uh, a flame barbecue. Um, Christmas lunch was in a camp oven that he um, had manufactured out of a big truck rim. Oh, wow. Um, which is amazing. And he'd bury it in the backyard. And, um, you know, we'd, that, that had just cooked the most amazing roast and vegetables. And then in the mid 80s, like a million other, you know, good Aussie blokes, he bought a nice uh, red Weber kettle. And, um, and that rolled on, you know, like roast lamb, roast chicken and so on. So, you know, for me, 
being able to sort of reflect on all of those things, um, it just seemed like a really good time to sort of make a change. And it was a huge risk. Um, you know, I was on really, really good money in the steel industry and I had to just sort of put that aside and, um, and I just wanted to cook. And so Jackalope was born as um, a catering business more than anything else. So I was doing, um, doing um, you know, markets and events and things like that um, back in 2015. So there wasn't a lot around back then. And um, I think it mentioned my sons were 15 or 16 at the time and they worked with me. And then, um, yeah, so it, it had its challenges because, you know, the way I was doing things, you know, people didn't necessarily value. So I was trying to follow the principles that my mother and grandmother taught me, which is everything from scratch. So, you know, we'd do milkshakes there as well. And I'd make my own ice cream, make my own mix-ins, oh, wow. all that sort of stuff. And, and people just, you know, which was great. And they were amazing, but I, I could never really get the value for them, you know? And then, um, once my, once my sons, um, were about to go into year 12, um, I had to make a decision that they weren't, going to be working with me anymore they really need to focus on that and whether i wanted to continue doing it without them and that is how you know we sort of pushed on to deciding to make rubs i was going to ask about that yeah so if you if you started in catering obviously you need rubs to cater what 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 was it about the rubs that 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 sort of pulled you more towards the rubs and away from from catering it was more around um so when i was catering i met um a, a, a lovely fellow, Mick Hobson, who um, is, uh, yeah, yeah, it's funny, funny reaction. That's pretty, that's pretty normal. So Mick, 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 uh, the Go Pie guy, as he was known back then, now with uh, Swank Not Bros and so on. And um, top dude, he's a top dude. Oh yeah, yeah, he's 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 um he's been one of my biggest supporters and one of my closest friends throughout the entire journey. So he's he's an amazing guy. And and we um years and years ago, moved, like we're talking, I think 2013, something like that. Um, I actually went to a cooking class. He was running. And um, this is just when a friend of mine and I were just sort of playing around with kettles at home and, and so on. So when I made the decision that I was going to, you know, try and turn this into a business, um, my friend said, oh, do you remember Mick? He's actually a really good guy. Why don't you go and talk to him? So I went up and had a bit of a chat to Mick about, you know, he was obviously doing really well with his pies and um, had a chat about, you know, what it might look like. And in the end, we sort of went back and forth for ages and he was just amazing, just so open with information and, he saved me so much time and energy in terms of what I needed to be able to set up a stall. And I ended up actually hiring his kitchen. So, um, so I went from, you know, doing a cooking class to all of a sudden working in his kitchen and, you know, it was a bit of a contra deal where it was penny rent. And then I would help him, um, make pies. So I've made thousands and thousands and thousands of good pies. (laughs) And, um, and uh yeah and it was it was great you know because you know with the two of us in there just you know really solid banter all day it was um just a great way to spend life there's a lot of people that just wish you'd do a little one night only out of retirement sort of thing and just do uh some pies so mick if you're if you're watching this mate just do us all a favor and make pies do it. just make pies, do make it. pies. exactly <laughs> all right so, so, um, let's, yeah, so let's so let's 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 swing it back to uh to to jackalope then um I understand that uh, that with all the craziness that's been happening in the last twelve months, that mm. um, that uh, whereas for a lot of people it's kind of been a real tough time, it's it's actually been really good for you. Could you tell us a bit about um, about how that's sort of played out for you? Yeah, had had some um, reasonably lucky timing um, through everything that was happening last year, in that um, I'd been working on doing an online store and just happened to launch that um, in March last year. So it was, um, yeah, so it was, it was right at the time when things started getting a bit silly and, um, obviously everyone's staying at home and cooking. Um, and so that, that was funnily enough, a really interesting little benefit. Um, so all of a sudden I had, um, you know, an audience across the entire country where I, where I could ship products to. Um, the other part is, um, I've always tried to make sure that my real focus is, um, stocking in stores with, with really good butchers. And um, obviously, you know, everyone knows that the butchers just went crazy. I think they had, uh, they had, I think I was speaking to one of them. They're saying it was like having Christmas three times in the year. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they were really, you know, struggling to keep up and so on. So having having the product in store was actually quite beneficial and allowed us to grow um, quite a, quite a bit in that sense, which was uh, which was lucky because my, my my day job was was the exact opposite. So um, it was. Um, 
yeah, interesting times. And, and, you know, the online store is, is I like having it. Um, it gives me a reach well beyond, um, you know, where, where I'm stocked at the moment, I'm still growing. Um, you know, there's still huge amounts of, of opportunity for growth in terms of getting, um, rubs interstate particularly. Um, so having the online store just allows people to have that reach, um, you know, until we can sort of get in store, I'd always sort of, you know, get, and then obviously we've got a couple of guys, you know, like Ironwood who, who have been selling the, the products on online for a while now as well. So, but, um, you know, I'd implore people to, you know, support your local guy, mm. um, if you can in the same way that they've supported me. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So with, um, with the, the, the online shop and you've got all your, your spice rub line in, in butcher shops there as well. Mm. Can you give us an idea of, of what it, what a day in the life of a rub manufacturer looks like? Cause I, I know that you're super busy cause you've, you've talked to me about, yeah. um, about almost being at that point at that tipping point where you're going to jump mm. all in full time. So what, what's an average day look like for you now? Um, if we're talking about a rub day, because we still don't day. have uh, a rub week, um, it's essentially um, these days um, just making sure everything's, it, it's a, a lot of it's about preparation because I, as I say, because I still have a job, it's make sure that everything's prepared for that day and everything um, goes smoothly because I've essentially got, you know, one to two days a week to get done what I need to get done. And obviously as we grow and, you know, I remember my very first mix I did at Mix Kitchen at the Goat Pie Guy and I had four flavors and I had these hand stickered pouches and it took me, I think about 10 hours to do 50 of each. So I did 200, 200 pouches in, in 10 hours. And um, these days I'm now ordering around about half a ton of spices at a time. Um, wow. you know, I've got some really, really, really good suppliers that have, um, you know, ensured that I, you know, maintain the quality of what I want to achieve. Um, and they have, and I'm getting sort of, you know, all, all my spices from one place, but then, you know, I get kosher salt from another place and you have to get really organized. And then, um, I still rent a kitchen. So, you know, part of what we're doing is, is to look into part of that investment with Steve is to, is to look at a permanent site because, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, once you're up at the scale of, um, you know, carrying around half a ton of spices and, and obviously all the uh, shakers and paraphernalia and scales and everything goes with it. It's a, it's a war effort just to get uh, the product to the kitchen <laughs> and get it made and then get back. So, but it's essentially a full day of, um, of me getting slowly choked to get choked to death from spices, I think. So <laughs> I'm, 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 inve- I'm investing in some, uh, some new, just amazing uh, masks with uh, cartridges and so on. And, and, um, but, um, yeah, so that's, and I'll be looking like I'm you know, on the set of Breaking Bad, um, pretty soon, I think. So, um, but it's an enjoyable time, lots of music, lots of banter and, um, yeah. And, and just get it done and ship it out. And that's, um, so yeah. And, and just making sure that we maintain the quality and, and it's interesting, like more and more, I, I saw your, um, I saw your podcast with, um, Smokey Q. And obviously he's, um, you know, utilizing co-packers. And I, I remember the Stag & Co one from, from a few months ago as well. And I sit there and go, well, you know, I must be the biggest mug of all time because I'm still making this product myself. But it's, uh, <laughs> everyone, oh, I could just give someone the recipe. They could do it for me. But, you know, to me, it's a, it's a labor of love. And um, I, I can't see, you know, part of the, the conversation that we've had as part of this partnership is that we will, we will make the product. And um, I think that adds value and, and it's actually in a world where less and less people are doing that. And, you know, I don't, you know, every, everyone's got a right. So I don't certainly knock anyone from doing, doing their own thing. I think um, mm. anyone can, you know, make a living and, and see how they see fit. But, but for me personally, um, it means a lot to make the product. Um, and, you know, we're looking at ways of investing in, you know, um, you know, we're still hand filling product as an example. So, you know, we're looking at some some filling machines that might be able to help there, and and making sure the blending. So yeah, because the ingredients are there, we we haven't used the machine for that. So we're literally still. I've got some some gloves that go up to my shoulders, and you know, I'm 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 deep in it, deep in it mixing, man. So it's um yeah <laughs> a lot. So and it's a good so day. If, though. So if you're still doing it by by hand, do you literally mean like you you pour all the ingredients into a big bucket and then put that glove on and then like mix like are you mixing sure by am. hand as as well as sure bagging am. by hand 
Sure am. Yeah. So wow. I've got some, um, yeah. So obviously with hand, we're saying heavy food grade gloves. Oh, that, of um, course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so, so just to sort of put that out there. But, you know, I used to use, um, I used to use um, just a, a mixing bowl that can hold about five kilos at a time back in the, in the early days. And um, now I've, I've got a bespoke um, tub made, you know, on, on a trolley and so on. So it's easy to transport and that, that can get about, it can get about 25 kilos at a pinch. So, wow. and um, I'll tell you what, it, it, yeah, I'll have, I'll have big guns pretty soon because it gets pretty hard to get through when, you know, the more you put in it, but um, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, literally hand mixing. And I think it's something that, you know, we will look at ways that we can um, uh, find a way that we can obviously increase the output because it does take time to do that as well. Mm. Um, increase the output, but also be able to maintain the quality as well. Like I don't, I need to make sure it's mixed properly and certain yeah. things like, you know, dark sugars and things like that, they don't naturally want to blend with powdery spices. So mm. um, I don't want a situation where, you know, someone in Melbourne or Adelaide is picking up my product and it's not what they want it to be because I've cut a corner. So yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I, I guess in that regard, then it's it's just a matter of just keep churning it, pull it out, look at it, keep churning until you get that consistency that you like. Very much so. So it's a grain, it's a uh, you know, it's it's a feel, it's it's all sorts, and you know, I've been doing it long enough that you just know that it, that when it's right and when it's done, um, it's it's um, my my mother used to have a saying when she'd give me a recipe and and I'd say you know how much a how long do I mix it for or how much do I put in. Or, and she'd just go, oh, just till it looks right. And I'd yeah. sit there and go, yeah, but I've never made it before. I'm not sure what it's supposed to look like. So <laughs> exactly. She'd, and, and, yeah. she'd, and she'd always just go, you know, you just know. You just know. And, and funny enough, you do something long enough and you just get a feel for it and you just know. So that's, um, as I was, again, watching one of the other podcasts where they're talking about feel rather than technology. And uh, I think that was, was that with Boomer, I think? So it was, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah and, and, and I could really relate to that in terms of, um, you know, just being able to, you know, get a feel for things rather than necessarily using technology and spices are very much that as well. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the big things that I did want to talk to you about was that, um, your, your rubs, your, you're very proudly stating on your website there, no filler, no artificial flavors, no colors, no anti caking agents. So mm. first of all, what, why have you taken that stance when so many other rub companies are putting in MSG and all this other sort of stuff in there as well? Yeah. And, and again, look, as I say, like, I think, you know, in, in, in my humble opinion, um, I'm, I think I'm honoring, you know, my family way. So when, um, um, Jackalope used to be called Jackalope slow foods moons ago, and it wasn't just about slow cooking it's trying to follow slow food principles in terms of everything from scratch, understanding where your food comes from. You know, the reason why I dealt with uh, Billy from Eater Billy is because he had direct relationships with farmers and things like that. So you could really have an understanding on where your product comes from. Um, so running on the idea that everything from scratch, I just wanted to make sure that what people were buying is exactly what it says on it. So, um, you know, so no fillers, no colors, um, you know, nothing, nothing artificial at all. Um, and that included anti-caking agents, which, um, I've found that, um, looking at some of the other stuff around or when I've sort of, you know, investigated it and so on, anti-caking agents are sometimes, you know, it works to offset other things that might go in there. So I've found that when using pure spice um, yeah, or, you know, obviously, you know, coffee in the, in the dark side as you're talking about or, or sugars and so on, if you use the right products, um, you don't um, really get caking. And, you know, and caking is, I guess, a term that's sort of thrown around. Like if I looked at, say, this, this shaker, you know, you can see that that is not falling down, right? So mm. it's actually dried out. But obviously, you know, caking... So if you give it a shake, you know, it's immediately powder, you know, yeah, and there's right. nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, caking is when you would not be able to do that. So it it's actually turns more rock. Like a, yeah, solid block. And, um, you know, and I've seen, you know, plenty of products and I guess, you know, some imported products and so on where, you know, they've got anti-caking agents and they're still just bricks. So I've, it's something that I've never had an issue with. And I remember about a year ago, I, was, I wanted to do a pastrami in it and, um, I found a pastrami rub in my um, in my pantry that still had the old hand stickered label. It was from the very first oh, wow. batch. No, it was like from maybe the second batch I ever did. So it was about three years old. 
And I opened it up and it was um, still powder, still tasted fine. You know, I think, um, you know, keep it in a dark space, a cool, dry space. Um, spices don't like moisture. So don't do stuff. If you're grilling, don't put your shaker over the top of the heat because steam will come up and moisture will get into the shaker and that will cause caking. So, you know, if you've applied the rub and it's on the heat and if you want to apply more product, put that product in your hand or put it in a bowl and then apply it. So don't hold your shaker over the heat. Otherwise, moisture is going to get in there and it will cake. So, yeah, that's mm. a good tip there. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm I'm curious about filler. What what sort of filler goes into other rubs? Like what what is a filler? Oh, you're, you're tempting me to be a bit controversial, Ben. So, oh, we're not. Oh, we're um, not going to name names. Like 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 we're not going to name names. No, but I, just uh, by a filler, I mean something that's not a food. You know, so um, you know, we're talking about um, you know, for me, as I say, I've got spices, I've got sugar, I've got salt. Um, I've got coffee and, and I guess anything might be a filler to me is anything that, you know, you wouldn't recognize as food. And that could be a whole heap of things. You know, that could be an artificial coloring agent that could be, um, yeah, other things that I won't name because there's, uh, I don't know, but like charcoal, I guess, if, if you know what I mean. So to yeah. me, um, uh, and look, and, and, and I just want to be clear is that I, I don't knock anyone making their product as they see fit, this is just what I do. You know, I don't yeah, think yeah, it's sure. particularly, I don't think it's wrong. Um, everyone's going to do their own thing. But for me, um, I want to make sure that everything in, in my product is, is, you know, it's something that I would recognize as food if I looked at the ingredients list. So that's, there we go. I'm going to get nailed now. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty. So now we're, we're going to jump now into the, uh, into the third segment. And this is your, your chance to share some wisdom with the, uh, with the listeners and the viewers. It's, it's a lesson hmm. from Todd. So, mate, what would you like to, uh, to teach us about today? I guess, um, if anything, talking about rubs in general or, you know, balancing flavors, um, you know, why you would use a rub, um, why um, you would use in conjunction with other things. Um, and again, you know, sort of talking about, you know, to me, from my theory, is that a rub's really part of the story and it's there to enhance the flavor of meat. Um, so, you know, I've sort of steered away from doing rubs that, you know, have, I guess, a be all and end all. So, you know, I, I, there's obviously quite a few on the market now that might have vinegar in it and things like that. Um, which is great, you know, if, if you want to make it easy and I s sort of sit there and think, well, to me, if I was making pulled pork, um, uh, which, which to me is quite a sweet meat. So my, I guess the rub that I made for pulled pork was the Memphis Magic Dust, um, which doesn't have any sugar. It, it's salty, it's spicy. It's, um, and then, um, you know, obviously the sweetness of the meat comes out. And then once you pulled it, you, you, you would put, you know, naturally put a sauce in it and that sauce would contain sugar and it contained vinegar and those sorts of things. So it becomes a balancing act in terms of, you know, rather than trying to find a product that does everything for you, um, use it in conjunction with other things. So, you know, I don't know, I'm assuming that everyone puts sauce in pulled pork. That's, um, you know, pretty, pretty standard. Do you, Ben, do you sauce your pulled pork once you've pulled it? Um, I usually put it, put the sauce on, um, what I'm having the, the pork end. on, if if, yep. if that makes sense. So I don't I don't blend the sauce through the yep. pulled pork itself. I'll put the pork on mm -hmm. the burger and then sauce the burger. Um, yep. Just just because I prefer it for each person to be able to have whatever sure or thing. how much sauce they want, that yep. sort of thing. But it's still it's still reflecting on it. it's quite similar in terms of being able to say, okay, well, you know, I don't think anyone's going to have a bowl of pulled pork. You know, so generally it's going to go on something. It's going to go on a taco. It's going to go on a burger, and there's going to be other things attached to that. You know, so the rub is really there to enhance the meat, which is then going to balance against other things as well. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd sort of encourage people to have have a crack, have, have a crack at making um, a product for yourself if you want to. So I know it seems um, you know, contradictory in terms of someone who actually makes rubs, but, you know, the, the you know, my, my business was born from me, you know, not wanting to sort of cater anymore, but still loving the flavors. And, um and, you know, so I just started blending my own rubs and then people sort of gave me feedback that they quite liked them and then away we went. So um, I think no one knows your own palate better than yourself. And I think, you know, you can 
you can use it in a couple of different ways. You can obviously use like people grab my product all the time and they sort of you know throw them together. Um, you know, SPG and dark side on, on brisket seems to be the, seems to be the go, going thing with a lot of catering guys as well. And I've been fortunate enough to, um, you know, supply commercial quantities to restaurants and, and barbecue catering guys now. And that's just what works for them. So, which, which works great in terms of feedback because when another guy comes along, I'll sort of tell them, you know, what other people are doing and, um, and that'll, that'll work well. So I think, you know, you can obviously either combine them or, you know, have a crack at making your own product you know there's really no mm. you know not to sell though because you know there's enough competition in the market but oh um, yeah of course your, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> certainly for your own uh, for your own cooking like you know as I say like people combining my products well there's nothing wrong with say you know i like a little bit more heat or i like a little bit more so you know grab one of the products and add some chili to it or even just you know start from scratch just trial and error and um it's a lot of fun it's it's mad science um and understanding what works for you but also what um what works for um you know the meat you're cooking with is um is a lot of fun and um write everything write everything down though if i could um give you one piece of advice um if you're making anything so if you're doing a recipe if you're making a rub if you're you know making a sauce write it down every time because um you know you'll end up like Tenacious D, who uh, wrote the greatest song in the world, yeah. and couldn't remember it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and you'll end, you'll end up with a tribute recipe. So, um, yeah, and <laughs> and my, I've got um, I've got an old book that has more crosses through it than actual recipes, um, where I've you know trialed different things and and just gone, what is going on here? You know, you have a bit of a vision on what you want it to want it to look like, and you try it, and you. Yeah, I don't think I'll get anyone else to try that one. So it's um, and just the line goes through it. But of course, eventually, you nail it, and that's the one. And um, and you know, from that point there, I sort of get, uh, I've got a, a small group of really close friends around me who um, I give product to, and they sort of give me their very honest feedback because they're real friends um, on um, on what they like and what they don't like about it. And a lot of the time it's actually, you know, pretty similar feedback. So you can sort of take that on and say, okay, well, okay. you know, that's clearly, I, I used to make, um, all of my rubs were hot because I love spice. Same. And, um, yeah. And, and the rub, the rub's an interesting one because, you know, I made it for lamb because I noticed that there, you know, most of the lamb rubs on the market were sort of herb driven and, and I'm not really, I'm a spice guy. I'm not a herb guy. So I wanted to make something that had a real, um, you know, real sort of spicy sort of, yeah, as in spiced flavor, not heat. But of course, mm. you know, me being me, I put a heap of um, heap of chili in it. And, um, you know, the feedback I got was sitting there going, oh, this tastes great, but what's what's that chili about? You know, so, um, and you have to be sort of willing to, you know, take on that honest feedback um, and say, you know what, like this might be great in my own home. Um, but, you know, obviously I'm trying to commercially create a business here and, and sell some products. So, um, yeah, so you have to sort of be able to take that feedback on. So, you know, again, I was quite firm when I first started in terms of saying, I'm just going to do what I want to do. Hopefully people like it. But, you know, as you sort of go on longer, I think the last the last two products I've made and, and the one we're developing right now uh, contain no chili. And dark side's got a little a tiny hint, tiny hint, you know. So you'd, you'd only really taste it if you put it on a steak. So I think, um, you yeah, know, because obviously you're talking about surface area of product, um, you know, if you did shorties or brisket, you wouldn't really get that heat kick. Um, and obviously it's cooked out for a long time as well. So, you know, if you're, um, if you're grilling a steak or something like that, you would get that little hint of heat. So, so that's my advice, write it down, write it down. Um, and, and just have a crack at playing around. So try and do things differently, you know? So, um, it, it's, there's a whole world of cooking over fire that, that goes so far beyond a brisket or a pulled pork or, you know, um, you know, grab some cuts and have a crack with it, you know, grab a butterfly lamb leg and cook it like a big steak. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's far and away my favorite thing to do. And, um, and it gives a lot of theater when people come around and, and, um, you know, you just end up just having a mad meat fest with, you know, Danish feta and crusty bread and make a salsa verde and things like that. So, you know, oh, so good good. share stuff, share it, share it with friends. So. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. When it comes to getting in and, and having a crack, what are the basic principles of making a rub that people need to be aware of? Oh, well, first of all, you're seasoning. You're actually seasoning meat. So, you know, I, my advice would be to always start with um, salt and pepper and um, get that balance right. 
um, and then start to build around, um, you know, what you actually want to create. So, you know, you, because you're not, you know, potentially creating a commercial product, you sit there and go, look, I want to, I want to make, you know, Greek food. I want to, I want to get a year. I want to get something spinning and, and just jump on and do a bit of research in terms of, you know, what that flavor profile is like. And, um, you know, so I'm obviously quite conscious that, you know, we don't, we don't steal recipes, but we're certainly influenced in terms of, you know, you might look at it and go, you know, I look at, um, you know, as I say like, you know, Turkish or Greek or whatever. And, you know, the rub we're working on at the moment is going to be, you know, um, hopefully, you know, spun on, uh, on chickens everywhere and lamb everywhere. And, you know, so we really sort of get that sort of Southern European vibe. So, you know, there's a lot of research in terms of reading, in terms of, um, you know, looking online at what, um, flavor profile is involved there and then it's just playing around and always like to try and you know get something a bit hidden get something a bit hidden that people won't you know they might taste it and go oh, that's, that's you know i'm not sure what's happening there but um you know they, they like it but they're not sure how and that sort of you know helps protect helps protect your product as well so but i think um yeah understand that you're actually seasoning meat it's not creating a whole you're not going to grab the thing and have spoonfuls of it so you know yeah. Mm. Um, and, and just to hark back to another thing that, that, that you said during your uh, lesson there, you mentioned that there was um, like spices and herbs. And I think because we've sort of grown up with KFC, we just hear herbs and spices together in a phrase and we just assume that yeah. they're all part of the same family. Can you give us an idea of the distinction between what is a spice and what is a herb? Oh, well, obviously, you know, herbs are, are leaves essentially. So, you know, they grow and grow. And so it's, um, uh, you know, obviously the stuff that you'll see, you know, in your, in your, uh, you know, Italian blend from master foods or whatever it is. So, you know, obviously, you know, oregano, rosemary, so on. Um, and then obviously spices, you're starting to get into ground products. So it might be, you know, sort of seeds or, or, you know, so on. It's obviously, you know, smoke dried ground. Um, you know, so we're talking like coriander and, and cumin and, and paprika and, and all those sorts of fun stuff. Um, you know, so that's, I guess the easiest distinction. I actually don't use, a huge amount of herbs and um because i'm just not a herb guy but um it's interesting with this as i say this one we're developing now obviously given the flavor profiles of that southern european it can be quite herby and um i'm having a lot of fun trying to find a balance that i think will work but also not being a fan of herbs so it's um yeah so that's i, I think um you get get a lot more get a lot more punch from using spices and um, but you know, what comes with that is having to, you know, really focus on how you balance that because you can just go, it doesn't take much for things to go too far the other way, particularly when you're using, you know, really strong spices like cumin and, um, and so on and cane and, and, and so, you know, it's very easy to go, you know, wow, well, we've made something really quite funky there that just doesn't work at all. So um, <laughs> go, go easy, go easy. So it's easy. It's easy to add to a blend. It's pretty hard to take away. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I I hear that. Yeah. Mm. All right. Look, that's probably a good point now for us to start to 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 wrap up this episode. So I'm going to throw the studio over to you. Give some shout outs. Give some thanks. Give some praise, and tell everybody where they can track down Jackalope on the interwebs. All right. So um, yeah. So Jackalope Trading Co. Obviously on Facebook under that search name um, at the Jackalope Trading Co. on Instagram. And uh, online at at um, thejackalopetradingco.com. Uh, we had to put the the in there because there's an American one that sells leather goods. So thejackalopetradingco.com. <laughs> yeah, so obviously online through a whole range of products and, and with our new venture, Ironwood Barbecue. Um, you can check them out at uh, Ironwood Barbecue and at Ironwood Barbecue and also ironwoodbarbecue.com.au. Um, in terms of shout outs, uh, if I start, I'll probably miss someone. Um, but you know, there's been, you know, far and away the best thing that that's come from doing barbecue is, is well beyond, um, the product well beyond, you know, although more so in the money, when people sort of give you feedback, um, it's just so humbling to, to sort of have people just say, you know, I love this rub or this is the best one I've tasted or so on. Um, I, I, I struggle to take it. I, I, I'd sort of. It, it's it's really really humbling and and I really appreciate it for anyone who's tried it and loved it. Um, so any consumer that's that's tried the product and and um, you know thanks thank you so much. You're obviously allowing me to try and live my dream. You know, there's been so many supporters. Obviously Steve from Ironwood who I've known for a number of years through through sponsoring and barbecue, um, the Empire Boys, 
Bundy and uh, and Matthew. So just amazing guys. Um, yeah, B- Billy Gibney has been a massive supporter to me, and Jackalope wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Billy. Um, he gave me a job when I was trying to develop um, Jackalope. So I, I worked for Billy for for a couple of years, um, literally just in his shop while while the Jackalope right. um, product was being developed. And he was the first guy, you know, he, when I said to him what my dream was. Um, and asked if he knew anyone that sort of needed help in a kitchen. He just said, well, look, come, come and work for me. And then when your product's ready, I'll put it on the shelf. And then, um, wow. you know, so he, he, was, he was the very first stockist and um, has been just an amazing support to me. And it just wouldn't have happened without him. Um, I was there yesterday and one of the guys was um, poking fun at me because, you know, for about eight months, they're like, where's the rubs? Where's the rubs? And I was, oh. uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, took, it took a while to get going. Um, yeah, Mick, Mick Hobson, goat pie guy, you know, again, wouldn't have been able to do it without him. So, um, there's just too many in there. I really don't want to, you know, if you've helped me, I love you. Um, that's all I can say. So it's, um, yeah, but, um, yeah, it's, it's just obviously my boys, my two boys who are, I don't know if they're listening, they're over there. I think they're playing, I pulled out the old PS2, so they're playing on a, I collect old retro gaming consoles, so they're, uh, I think they're playing buzz at the moment but, oh, okay. uh, yeah. and, and again um yeah they've been a massive support to me so and everyone in my family so it's just been amazing there you go there's enough shout outs that it i'm gonna forget someone someone's gonna get there someone's gonna get cranky here but oh that's okay they can just yeah. um send all the send all yeah. the angry messages to you and not to me well, look, that, i will say every, every stockist that's had a crack you know because there's big there's big um, opportunities. There's, there's there's big companies out there making their stuff. So you know all the all the guys you know from like Super Butcher have been amazing. Um, you know Cha 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 in Melbourne Q Club have recently come on board. So really appreciative of that. So you know everyone who's sort of just been able to just give us a crack. Two butchers in Springfield. Um, yeah, anyone who's been willing to just take on board a, a little local guy making his product. Um, you know I, I can't appreciate it enough. So good, man. So good. Well, look, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. Um, you've got to, I guess, go and start preparing for this uh, catering gig tomorrow. So thank you for taking oh, some time yeah, out of that. Rubens uh, to go, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, Rubens. Sorry, yeah. Enjoy yeah. that. Yeah, I will. Yeah. But look, th- uh, thanks for coming on board the show and for sharing the, the Jackalope story with us all. Thanks very much, Ben. And there you have it, family. That was Todd from Jackalope. Now, I'm in all seriousness, the dark side is one of our favorite rubs here at Smoking Hot Confessions. So that was really good for me to be able to uh, to talk to him and just let him know that face to face and um, and to get that story behind that rub and behind Jackalope Trading Co. Um, as we did say, there's no filler, no artificial flavors, uh, no um, colors, no anti-caking, all that sort of stuff. So uh, it's just a beautiful natural product. Um, it's all Australian made. And it's uh, hand blended. It's it's artisan quality products. It's so good. It's so good. You really should check it out, and you're gonna really enjoy that. All right. So just before we go, a quick reminder. Big um, shout out to our podcast partner Jagged for coming on board. If you are looking for a new smoker or grill, they do a whole bunch of different stuff. If you got a if you got a custom kitchen fit out, give them a call. Glenn loves a challenge, so he can design and build just about anything you want. Um, winter is coming. Check out the hoodies and beanies over on smokinghotconfessions.com. The award-winning Hail Mary design is on the back of the hoodie and our beautiful 3D stitchings up on top of the beanie there. So that they're all done locally as well. So that's, uh, an, another local family owned business that you could support there as well. Um, Barbicon is coming June 26 and 27. Keep that weekend free. Smoking Hot Confessions is bringing you the world's first virtual barbecue conference. It's going to be a super cool weekend. We're going to be jumping into the backyards of a whole bunch of different uh, amazing cooks and incredible barbecue business owners as well. So plenty of knowledge to be downloaded and shared there. Um, Jump onto smokingonconfessions.com if you're at the start of your barbecue journey. Pick up the Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. It's a fantastic award-winning read there as well. So we picked up an award for that recently at the NBBQA. And do come join us over in the Smoky Hot Confessions Barbecue community on Facebook. It's one of the friendliest corners of the internet to be, and it's where we do these live podcast recordings. So do come join us for that, and you too can leave comments and questions for our guests. And if you are watching, of course, on the social medias or listening on the social medias or listening on a podcast app, 
Do all the likes and shares and comments for us. It helps drive the algorithms and pushes our show out further. And we really do appreciate that as well because we do love your support and we love to do this show for you. So it's a, it's a, it's a reciprocal, reciprocal, reciprocal thing. <laughs> all right, that's enough. Let's, um, let's wrap this up. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>